Greetings, greetings, family. Welcome, welcome to the Sister Shanice Show. I am delighted. I am honored that we are going to be having a wonderful discussion with you again this evening. As you can see, two of my guests are already in the house. We've got our brother Michael <coughs> Evans from, Cap from the USA. And we also have our prophet Meduti from the UK. Uh, Sister Shanice here is uh, coming to you live and direct from the Gambia. Yes, it's a beautiful sunny evening, a warm summer's night here in the Gambia. Uh, I can hear the birds tweeting away outside. Oh no, I think it's probably the crickets actually. The birds are probably sleeping by now. Uh, but, you know, it's just sounding beautiful. And I wish the entire family from the diaspora was here as well. We have, just joining us back screen, uh, our sister Kai in the house. Rise up, rise up, sis. And greetings, welcome. sis. Happy greetings, happy. everyone. Yes. Uh, <laughs> me, yeah, let me run around and allow the panel just to greet each other and to greet uh, our audience who are already in the house. Uh, Michael uh, Evans, please <coughs> greet our audience. Then uh, Kai, and then our beloved prophet. So greetings from Southern California. Um, just want to say hello to everybody. And I'm um, looking forward to interacting with the rest of the panel as we talk about uh, what it, does it mean to have economic emancipation throughout the diaspora. Oh, great things, family. Thanks so much, Sister Shanice, for giving me the opportunity to be here tonight, I'm very, very excited about tonight's discussion, and uh, I believe we're going to go home learning lots of things, but not only learning, but implementing those things as well. So thanks so much for having me on, and hi to everyone in the chat. Uh, yeah, all tip, all tip and um, greetings in the name of the creative force of the universe, the omnipotent being that which is greater than ourselves. Who has many names, Olodumare and Kulukulu, Kwame Blafor Ashe Mungo Onyeme Ulume Alre Amenra Ashe Ashe Rise up my African family. Sorry, my brother. Uh, it. Yeah, I was just saying um Akwaba to all African family across the world. Anyway you're there, anyway you are tuning, and Akwaba to Brother Michael and sister I'm from well Michael is from California. Sis, where you where you transmitting from, sis? Southeast London. Southeast London. Oh, oh, well, you cross the road from you. You just cross. You just yes. cross the road from me. Come yes. in Southwest London. Yes, 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 Prophet. We are in this together. Hopefully, yeah, hopefully yeah, soon. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Yeah. Picking up the South Londoners in the house and also going over to the chat. Let's see who we've got in the house. Yes, yes, we've got uh, Etana and uh, she is uh, viewing us from, she says, sunny UK. Is that right? You've got sunshine in the UK? <laughs> or is mm -hmm. it just sunny? There's the sun just shining in Etana's house. <laughs> That's beautiful. Shining from the inside out. And uh, we've got New Berlin, uh, Divine Rising to one and all from the UKKK. Oh, rise up, rise up, uh, New Berlin. We've got Winter Bacon in the house as well. We've got uh, uh, Slyer Bonga in the house. He's saying very important topic today. We've got Afri Jamo in the house from Ghana. We've got my sister Verna in the house and she's saying, oh, you're looking sun-kissed, sis. Yes, the sun just had deal with me out here. I mean, I love it. You know, I love it as well. <laughs> Topping up my melanin. I get us jealous, mm -hmm. sister Shanice. I know. <laughs> Miss sorry, Miss sorry, people. Miss sorry. And uh, we've got Robin Rose in the house, another South Londoner. We've got Royal Rising in the house. Family, welcome, welcome. And Afri Jamo is giving some fists to the Diaspora channel. Uh, beautiful. Yes, our sister uh, Kai, do you want to just introduce the Diaspora? I will introduce each of you in a short while. Ah, we have our other guest in the house. We have Lady O, who's joining us Ooh. from Canada. Ah, wonderful, wonderful. 
So we have all of our guests in the house. We're about to start in a very short while. Uh, but before we do, let me just allow uh, our sister uh, from the Diaspora channel to tell us a little bit about her channel. Oh, yes. The channel is the Diaspora channel. So he explained already what the channel is about. But I'm going to go a little bit you know, deep into it. I'm Kai Gabiam, that's my full name. And, uh, you know, I'm from Togo, yeah. So that's West Africa, but I'm African first. So that's why the, the platform represent us all. It's not about me, it's about us. So um, I started this uh, channel like um, 2019, yeah, January 2019, I'll start, you know, with, uh, just posting, you know, product from black owned businesses globally. Because at some point you just sit down and look around and ask yourself, what what can I do? Instead of always, you know, sitting back and then know what is happening, but think is the responsibility for others. I just say, let me start the page. I start the, uh, the page by Black First UK on Instagram. So with that, I've been posting, you know, different, product from brothers and sisters in the states and here also in the uk just to showcase you know who is doing well within our global black family so fast forward six months uh, after that i just realized people can easily you know just uh, hide behind any screen and say oh you know what uh, you know this is a black owned business can you just you know put my product out there so that's where the idea of the YouTube channels came in. So I'm like, yeah, that would be good for me to see who is behind every brand and also give them the opportunity to interact with the viewers and show them the product and just for them just to know them, like how we do it back home is all about, you know, connecting with one another. So that's where the diaspora uh, channel came from. So all Brilliant. about showcasing us and our products and brothers and sisters that are doing amazing things in our global african family black family when it comes to being the change so we have them wow. on as well so they can actually know that we see them we appreciate them and just thank them for what they are doing like you know yourself sister shanice you know how you know i feel about you already i know brother uh, prophet yeah but you know i know what he is about as well so thanks so so much for doing what you guys are doing i will be knowing more about lady o and our brother michael tonight but the diaspora channel is our channel so if you're a business owner simple you just need to contact me and we do some digging some digging put, your, put, your details, put, your details in the chat. put the de put your contact details in the chat and let me just okay. allow Prophet Maduti to talk about his Facebook live shows as well. Because I tell you, when this man do him radio show him on fire. And, uh, you know, he does a Facebook live as well. So family, family, make sure you lock into our Prophet on his Facebook live shows. Please, Prophet, just uh, share with the family when they might be able to catch <clears> you <throat> on the Facebook, book, as you call it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, I do feel well. Um, I'm part, I'm, I'm a presenter like Sister Shanice on galaxyafiwe.com. That's galaxy a f i w e dot com. We are uh, a D brain dirty in D brain washing station, and we have a lot of presenters who bring different information, talk shows. My talk show is on a Thursday evening from 9 p.m. till midnight GMT. So you can work out, you know, where is this Greenwich Mean Time, wherever you are in the world. And sometimes I have guests. I, in, I have a, a slot that I call the Unsung Heroes. So I talk about people doing things in our community that we don't hear about because there's this misnomer that the Africans are not doing anything. We're just sitting down here docile, and that's incorrect. And because we do not own these big um mainstream advertising and television stations, 
the real Africans who's doing the real grassroots work, they do not have advice. So I tend to give them advice. Last week, I had on one of our herbalists, doctors, um, Dr. Oliver from Jamaica, and Dr. Alkaline here, who are herbalists, and we was looking at ways to prevent ourselves from catching the court, the C-19 thing. And so we, we did that. So earlier for the go on the Facebook and tapping Kweku Bonso, that's K W A K U B O N S U, and you will see a an ank and you log on that and I'm on the Facebook. And if there's anybody that you know, like the sister here, Kai, you know, you you, you, you know, you, um you just cross the road. So you don't know about them, so you just cross the road. Um <laughs> I'll take your details because I'd like to interview about the diaspora channel as as well. That that'd be very interesting. So that's what I do on, on a it's Thursday. Okay. And then on a Sunday, on a Sunday, I'm on 10 a.m. to 12 midday GMT time. I burn the fire for black people. I'm going to take, mm -hmm. I'm going to take no check. I'm going to take back no talk. For real, I tell you, okay. if you want to come away feeling on fire, you know, to do the works, the Pan Africanist works, just tune in to Prophet Maduti on a Thursday night or on a, a Sunday morning GMT time. So I will put the details uh, in the description underneath this chat as well. Okay, let me uh, start introducing our guest. Our, our sister lady hasn't had the opportunity to introduce herself as yet, so I will be starting with her. But before I do, I want to thank everybody in the audience for, uh, for, for listening. I want to thank you in advance for sharing information about this show. Please tell a friend, please message a friend. Uh, please let everybody know about this channel. As our prophet was saying, there are so few platforms that we have as a people where we can come together and talk about issues that are of concern to us. Talk about issues where, you know, it's from an African-centered perspective. So this is a platform that enables us to do that, just like the Big G Galaxy Afiwi enables us to have these really important conversations. And uh, because, you know, we are scattered all over the world as a people, you know, each one can reach one. So it's up to you, our invaluable viewers, you know, to put the word out about these channels and to let people know that, hey, if you want to tune in to a channel where they're talking about African liberation, African advancement from a spiritual economic economical, physical, and all the different perspectives, tune into the Sister Shanice Show, tune into the Diaspora channel, tune into Prophet Majuti uh, on the Facebook, tune into the Big G, Galaxy Affili, the only deep brainwashing station. These are our platforms and our mediums that we need to use and we need to support uh, to get the word out to our people. So. So those who are already supporting the movement, uh, I thank you so, so much. We all thank you for all of the subscribers. I thank you so much. I'm trying to get my subscribers up to 10,000 by the end of January. I can still make it. You know, I'm just a, a few uh, people away from 7,000. So it's about just 7,000 and 10 or so that I need to get to 10,000. So, you know, please do share, share, share. You know, we are the ones who are going to have to get our messages out to our people. We can't expect others to do it for us, okay? And so we all have a role and responsibility to ensure that we're reaching our people with the correct narrative because it's our narrative that's going to be shaping our minds and our opinions. And it, it, what, whatever we have in our mind to do, uh, that we will do. So we have to make sure we have the right information in our mind so that we carry out the right actions. All right, family, rising up the entire, entire family. Let me um, also thank my Patreons. Those of you who are supporting me on Patreon, much, much love to you. And if you're not already one of my Patreons, what are you waiting for? Hey, just go on to www.patreon.com forward slash sister Shanice or search me for me in Patreon and you can become one of my supporters for as little as three pounds a month. Every little make a mockle. Hey. All right, family. Let me introduce to you Lady O, who is the CEO of Lease, L-E-A-S-T, Incorporation. And that's the parent company of Oak Network and several other businesses. She's the mother of four resilient children 
and two intuitive cats. She's committed to helping our community rise up and out of its slumber and toxicity that our ancestors are waiting for us to do. Her passion is for women to regain their matriarchal position and become guardians of the galaxy once again. My sis, please greet uh, our audience today. Lady O, uh, take there yourself you off. Go. Yes, yes. Yeah, I'm so you. used to you saying, mute your phones, everybody. Mute your phones. <laughs> <laughs> I mute my phone and I'm like, oh, I got to unmute. So thank you so much, uh, Sister Shanice, uh, for that introduction. Thank you for being um, inviting me to be on the panel today. Uh, this topic is uh, something that I'm definitely interested. I'm interested in all of your topics. So when I saw this topic today, I'm like, yes, I definitely uh, want to be a part of it. And then the invitation came for me to be on the panel. So thank you so much. Because you know, I'm always here, either in the chat or you know, I'm in, um, I'm right, right on the screen with you. I'm always here with you, my sis always sharing so please share this video like this video the algorithms is going to bring more people in share the information i'm so happy to also share the platform with michael evans michael it's good to see you again um uh, we met on the africa views uh 2020 global summit by uh, ot samuels ot if you're in the chat good to good to see you in the chat um and michael was an amazing presenter and he presented um, his powerful financial plan. And so I'm happy that he's uh, he's here. I know he was on the show, um, your uh, your Galaxy After We show. And I listened to that and I was like, fire his information. Like, um, I'm super excited because when we did our, our pre-show and what he shared with me, I was super excited. And I know your audience is going to be super excited about what he has to share. I'm just kind of upset that I'm not able to immediately take action because I'm in Canada. Uh, but I've been trying, Michael, I've been diligent in trying to find a way, but where there's a will, there's a way. Um, but what he's gonna show Man. is gonna be phenomenal um, for anybody that's able to take part in it, hit the ground running. Um, and in anything, you know, uh, Sister Shanice was also on the summit with us, uh, the Pan-African, the 2020 Global Pan-African Summit that AfriView is hosted on Oak Network. And Oak Network is one of my uh, subsidiaries. Uh, Least Inc. is the parent company of many other uh, companies that are founded, uh, launched, visioned. Um, and uh, so Oak Network did that summit. So thank you, Odie Samuels of Africa Views of uh, partnering with me. And that summit was similar like what the Diaspora channel is speaking about. It was a platform for diaspora entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs from the motherland to showcase their businesses so that we know who you are, where you are, what you do. One of my cats is trying to get on screen. Uh, what you do and um, how we can serve you and how we can collaborate because our money bounces out of our community way too fast. We know, we've heard it, we know it. And although we know it, we've heard it, we still do it. And so I try to eliminate all excuses uh, for anybody to say they don't know, they didn't know that this person could serve them, they didn't know this business exists. And I'm here to give a platform for the diaspora entrepreneurs to connect with the motherland entrepreneurs, vice versa, see how we can do businesses. Because if I need a service here in Canada, but there's someone that is from my community that can serve, I prefer to bounce my money there. And I'm encouraging us to keep bouncing our money within each other's borders, knowing and entrusting that when we get the money, we bounce it back again to another brother okay. and another sister, right? That's okay. very, very important. So that is what, um, that's how we met. And I'm so excited for this opportunity to hear more of what Michael has to say. And greetings, okay. Prophet Maduti. Greetings, my king. <laughs> greetings, my king. Awesome. My queen. Awesome. So I'm going to introduce Prophet uh, formally, and then I'm going to introduce Michael, and he's going to go into topic. And then when we bring back in our sister Kai, I will do the formal uh, uh, introduction there as well. But we have new listeners and uh, new viewers. And so, you know, I want to let our family know a little bit about who we have uh, in the house. So we have our brother uh, Maduti, who we affectionately know as Prophet Kwaku or the Prophet. And uh, as he said, 
uh, when he was greeting the families of presenter on the Big G Galaxy Afiwi every Thursday inside the Nubian Forum People's Talk Show from 9 p.m. through to midnight GMT time. And that's on galaxyafiwi.com. And he speaks about things that relates to our African community globally. He's also a teacher and teaches at the Nubia African Community Foundation Saturday School uh, that has been running for 30 years. It's an African-centered school. And if you want to support that school in any way at all, financially with its curriculum or whatever, please make sure that you reach out to our brother, Prophet Baduti. Uh, he's also a community activist, former chair of the African Emancipation Day Re Repatriation March Committee. He's a popular UK stand-up edutainer on the black uh, comedy circuit. He's a photographer at ADE Photographic Services and Sharp Photography. Uh, he does print, videographic work, he's a painter and decorator, but his main passion is African liberation, psychologically, culturally, uh, physically, spiritually, technologically, economically, uh, politically, you know, and just prefers to talk about uh, Africation as opposed to education. Uh, profit, let's allow you a few minutes to uh, widen your greeting before we bring in uh, the topic for discussion today. No, just to say that um, we give the ancestors thanks and a quaba to the panel. It's beautiful to see that we have a couple of sisters on here with us to keep the balance because it's a mahatical thing we're dealing with. And I don't want to take up too much time because, you know, there's so much people on here. So give thanks. Give thanks to you, Prophet, every time. Yes, uh, the panel, uh, the viewers will say, we need more female energy and... Uh, your wish is our command. And uh, they spoke you all into existence. And I love it. I love it. Okay, let me introduce to you, family, our brother Michael Evans. He is the president of the Black Nationalist Investment Clubs for Rebuilding Black Detroit, a series LLC. He's also the president of Help Keep My Money, LLC, a black-owned business management consulting business that's located in Southern California, where he provides consultancy services to government agencies, small businesses, non-profit organizations, and real estate investors. He has a bachelor's degree in economics from La Loya uh, Mayamont University, where he was the school's first recipient of the Wall Street Journal's Award for Excellence in Economics. He has more than 20 years of experience in developing and managing complex operational and financial systems. His experience includes four years as the chief financial officer, that's a CFO, deputy director of finance and administration for Santa Barbara County's mental health department, where he developed and managed a $106 million dollar annual budget while overseeing multiple divisions including finance and accounting, IT, quality assurance, medical records, facilities and administration. Michael was an active real estate investor from 97 through to 2005 and was paid $15,000 to buy his first house. He is also the developer of the real estate deal management systems, a proprietary closed sales system for managing and shrinking risk while creating 25% profits per deal. Michael has been married to a wonderful wife, Tamika, since 2008, and they have lived in the Antelope Valley of Southern California, that's 60 miles north of Los Angeles, since 94. They have a total of five children, and their first grandchild is on the way during March 21. <laughs> He runs a black nationalist platform, Survive in America While Being Black. And uh, as a black nationalist, believes that we must take it upon ourselves to save the black community without begging the government to help, but still take advantage of every law, program, and system that exists. He's developed a structured financial program that can move, he says, the African black community forward. So we welcome our brother today to the Sister Shanice Show to introduce to us this program. And then from there on, the discussion that we're going to be having about money, economics, uh, and the African community. Michael Evans, welcome. The wow. Florida. I want to. I really want to thank you for that introduction. Um, I've never been introduced um, like that. Um, I'm extremely humble um, to, to, to be here and to be uh, among um, such 
uh, other great uh, black nationalists and pan Africanists. And so I, I want to start off with um, that um, we do call ourselves black nationalists. Okay. And here in the United States, that term has had a negative connotation. If you look it up on Google or in Webster's dictionary, you'll see militant, you'll see separatists, you'll see segregists. But we, meaning black folks, have um, chose to self-identify as black nationalists. And we define black nationalists as meaning anyone who wants to support the black community to become self-sufficient, self-reliant, and self-determinant as expressed by the behavior, actions, and words, regardless of your skin color, your so-called race, your religion, your sexuality, your gender, or your political affiliation. And so the real question is, if you don't self-identify as a black nationalist, then what do you identify as? So when we self-identify as um, black nationalists, we believe that we are here to support the black community to survive America while we plan, strategize, organize, and execute our exit to Africa. Because ultimately, that's where we need to go back. Now, we know that everybody's not gonna wanna go back to Africa. So for those who choose to stay in the United States, they have to survive America while black. And so um, we developed a website called Surviving America while black.com. And there you will see our mission, our um, definition of um, black nationalism. And we really go off of Malcolm X's definition of black nationalism as um, he described it in his um, famous, the ballot or the bullet speech, in which he said there are three philosophies associated with black nationalism. There's the political, there's the economic, and there's the social. And so at this time, what we're focusing on is the economic because we must build an economic base, okay? The one thing that we know is um, the African continent has been chopped up into 55 little itty bitty countries compared to the six or seven major kingdoms that traditionally uh, have existed in, um, in the continent. And it was done on purpose. It was strategic in order to, um, to take away the economic and military might of the continent. Then you add those Africans that have been spread throughout the diaspora that um, were, whose connection was severed culturally from Africa to where we don't even know what our roots are, right? Um, and so it's, it's, it's time for us to make a plan to go back home. And when we go back home, we need to bring our um, resources back with us, both our financial resources, as well as the brain trust from the diaspora um, and bring it all back to bear in order to, um, as I say, I'm a MAGA fan, make Africa great again. Mm -hmm. Ashe. So, um, you want me to roll into exactly what our what our plan is? Or do you want okay, to have well, a, uh, a discussion? Before we do, you know, uh, let, let's just uh, talk about definitions because you actually um, gave a really interesting definition. The first time I heard that definition of black nationalism was when he was on my show on Wednesday, actually, which took me a bit by surprise because you actually identify non-black people as black nationalists, which is a really, well, I thought was quite bizarre, but interesting, you know, and it's fine for different organizations to have their own uh, definition uh, of things, but uh, you know, obviously, from a pan Africanist uh, perspective, when we talk about uh, black people, uh, it's African stroke black, and uh, yeah, when we talk about 
pan-Africanism and black nationalism in the UK, you know, it is uh, exclusively talking about Africans, melanated people. So it's interesting that in your part of the world, you know, you've broadened that black uh, to include non-Africans. But actually here in the UK, we have a group that they call BAME, uh, the Black and Ethnic Minorities Communities. And that includes all your, your so-called other groups who are non-European, like the Chinese, the Indians, uh, etc. in the BAME. So interesting, interesting concept. And uh, we'll hear some more about how that's working in your neck of the woods. Uh, before we go back, any other panel members like to comment on that definition or anything else that our brother has said by way of opening? Yeah, I'd like to. No, go on, sis. I'll let you talk. Go on. I was, I was just going to piggyback on what Sister Shanice says. The first time I heard Michael explain that, I was like, that's a different spin on it. And I was like, how is that working? Um, in the definition there um, as to include anyone that supports um, our liberation and our self-sufficiency. So um, myself too, uh, when I heard it here in Canada, I was like, that's a different spin on it. Um, and I understand the more he explained to me, I understand where he was coming from. But again, when you first hear it, you're like, hold on a minute, what? So um, I, I would wait for Michael to expand on it and to explain how is that um, reverberating back into his community when he says it and explains it that way. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll take my brother and my sister. Yeah, so. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what um, your full definition is. I've just heard a brief explanation of it. Um, um, however, I'm strictly dealing with African people I would do business with other people because we're on a planet with different groups of people. But when we're organizing structures and things like that, I'm strictly African. Um, I'd have to hear a bit more about the brother's explanation and I don't think this is the place for it. That's another platform for another time because we're talking about the economics. If it falls within the criteria of what we're talking about, I'd be glad to hear, hear, hear more, definitely. But for me, it's strictly African. Oh, Shay, rise up, rise up. Let's go so, over to the economics and uh, find out about this uh, plan that can help to rise us as a people uh, from the financial situation that, um, you know, we find ourselves in in so many inner city areas in the diaspora. Rise up, over to you, my brother. Sure. So, so before I move on, I do, I do want to just uh, talk about um, African. Okay. So understand every single human being that exists on this planet is of African descent. Okay. Every single homo sapien derived from Africa genetically. So when we start talking about what do you define as an African, OK, this is where we need to start looking at how do you behave? Do you support the values of what is traditionally defined as an African? So, again, skin color, race, um, those are things that were made up by white terrorists in order to try to divide people. What I'm concerned about is. What is your behavior, actions, and words saying? How do you support the black community? Because, and I'll just be honest, with you, I know some so-called white people that act more black than some of the darkest black people that I know. So I don't, I don't care about what your skin color is. I care about what have you done? What do your actions show to prove that you support the black community? So that's why we defined it the way that we did. Okay, right. let me, let me announce Sorry? Mr. Shanice. Um, yes, my brother. This is, why, this, this, this is why I said it. Uh, this topic here is, is, needs a, a show in itself. Yes, you know, I Because I, I, I don't agree. I don't, Let's uh, do one that. One second. I don't, ag I, I don't agree that all of us are come from the same route. Me neither. I don't agree with that. It's, <laughs> a, it's a theory. 
and there are other and these are all theories that have um scientific evidence to back them up if you read um, um civilization of barbarism and um, shake unto the up he, he deals with um, um that sort of thing the reality is this is that to that last statement that you know some white people that behave more um african or black than african and black people you know you t you know that that statement in itself can be debunked because we know that the um the europeans um kidnap us put us in their concentration camps um, imp um impregnated some of us um raped all of us man woman and child you understand me them never partial destroyed our culture destroyed our language destroyed our mores etc and our spiritual uh, uh um our spiritual practices and our economical base, which we're talking about, and then turn us into these very same people who do not behave African now. Who would say them is not African themselves? So I refute that statement by my beloved brother, but I feel that it would take another show just to deal with that. Yeah, and I agree. And I think we need to have a where we have this conversation and you know it's fine for people to have their own particular uh, opinions and beliefs we you know we are a diverse you know community you know we don't all share the same views we we are from different ethnic groups we have different religions some of us you know have different belief systems and you know that will come through on some of these shows but the one good thing is is that the people who we do have you know have the interest of our people at heart. Uh, some will say people generally, mm. but uh, definitely looking to offer something that you know our entire community uh, as Africans can benefit from. So we will park that conversation, which is a whole nother show and a very whole interesting show. It will be as well. So we will have that discussion and you're welcome to come back, Michael, uh, when we have that discussion and, and profit. But let's go turn the conversation now <laughs> over to uh, economics. And uh, you ready to go into that now, Michael? Oh, yeah, most definitely. Okay. So right. um, when 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 George Floyd was murdered, back in May of last year, um, here in the United States, we had the rapper Killer Mike, who's also uh, a black activist out of Atlanta. Um, he was on national TV um, with Mayor Bottoms and he made a profound statement. And this is something that Killer Mike has been saying for years. He says, we as black folk, we need to plan strategize, organize, and mobilize. He said, sure. we are great at organizing and mobilizing. We are horrible at planning and strategizing. When I heard that, I decided to take him to task and I got with some other <clears throat> um, like-minded people that were part of um, a Facebook group called the Blackout Coalition. Now, Anybody that's on uh, that's on Facebook may have heard it. It was started by a gentleman named um, Calvin Martin um, back in at, in the beginning of May, right? Calvin's goal was to get fifty thousand black folks to boycott purchasing anything on July seventh to show some economic solidarity. Once um, George Floyd was murdered. And July 7th came around, his Facebook group, which had a couple hundred people at the beginning of May, because I was at the beginning, on July 7th had 1.7 million black people, right? Mm. That showed that the tide had turned. In less than two months, he went from a group of a couple hundred people to 1.7 million people, and that decided on July the 7th to show their economic power by not buying anything. But on July the 8th, they asked Calvin, what's next? What next, Calvin? What's the plan, Calvin? Now, of course, Calvin was overwhelmed. He wasn't anticipating 1.8 million people to show up. He was getting 16,000 um, 
Facebook post requests every single day. He didn't have the um, expertise to manage that. He didn't have the organizational capacity. And it took him several months to really get his feet underneath him in order to handle that. Well, me and some other people from um, the Blackout Coalition decided we need to sit down, we need to strategize, we need to plan, and we need to come up with a plan. And that's what we did. We came up with an economic plan. And our economic plan is this. We use investment clubs coupled with qualified opportunity funds in order to create private black gated, uh, I'm sorry, private gated, black owned and controlled master plan communities in America. Okay, so let me go back over at that again. We use investment clubs in order and, and team it with qualified opportunity funds in order to create private gated black owned master planned communities. So here's the reason why we decided with investment clubs. Here in the United States, investment clubs are designated by the IRS as social clubs. In the United States, social clubs can legally discriminate. That's how we have our fraternities. That's how we have our sororities, where they discriminate based on gender. So by using um, investment clubs, we can legally discriminate by those that self-identify as black nationalists, supporting the black community through their actions, behavior, and their words. We use investment clubs to practice group economics in order to bring our money together. Investment clubs also are defined by the SEC in the United States. An investment club is a group of people who come together to invest in stocks, bonds, real estate, other types of, of securities. And as long as it's less than 100 people and $5 million of, of assets under management, they're all active investors and there's an education component. They do not get regulated by the SEC. So what are we doing? We are strategizing and using the government's systems to our benefit in order to self repriate And you'll hear me use that term, self reparations What that is, is rather than waiting and begging for money from the government, from the United States government specifically to give us reparation that's due to us, we use their systems, their regulations and their laws in order to pool our money together and our resources in order to create our own reparations. And so this is a method for us to self repriate so, so that's the basis of how we in the United States are able to use the United States laws in order to practice group economics. So any question on that so far? Okay, rise up, rise up my brother. Thanks for outlining that. Let's go to the panel. And uh, um, what I'm going to do as well is bring in you know, some other aspects of um, the economy that in fact, that uh, affect us as a people as well. But let me go around to the panel and hear from our panel members, first of all. Lady O, over to you, my sis. Thank you so much, Sister Shanice. So in just recapping the first part of what you just said, uh, Michael, you're saying that you're using um, our group economics to create um, a self-sustained, a private gated community for for our for our community. And that's that's that is basically that's what that's what the first part of what you just Correct. mentioned is about. Okay. And what you're saying is that you're using you this was birthed from the feedback that you saw from that movement from Calvin Mater that individuals from our community are looking for ways to financially um, make that statement um, that we know money talks. 
picketing, protesting, all of that is great. But what you're saying is when he made that call for a financial response, that's what you saw the community eagerly responded to. So you put your brains together with some other individuals and say, okay, how can we really make an economic impact? Is that what that, that was just the gist of the first part? Mm -hmm. Let's go with that. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Because what, because, because what, because, because 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 what we saw is with the with the murder of George Floyd, we saw a level of awareness, especially here in the United States, that we haven't seen since the L.A. riots of 1982, when everybody saw Rodney King getting beat half to death. OK, and except this time now, this sentiment is worldwide. Right. This level of awareness is a worldwide awareness. Right. It's been labeled the Black Lives Matter movement, which is way bigger than the Black Lives Matter organization. Okay. Um, and what we saw just from this one Facebook group going from a couple of hundred, 1.7 million in two months was a desire to take action, but there wasn't a plan. Right, Got right. It. Got it. Up. So, and also just to say that, you know, this is a, um, a strategy that could be rolled out, you know, globally. It's a strategy that can be applied in Africa. It can be applied in, uh, in Canada. It can be applied in, in the UKKK. So, you know, for those who may be living outside of America and are thinking, well, I don't really want to invest in America. You know, it's a concept and, and a program that can actually be started anywhere in the world. Uh, so, so do look at it from that perspective. Lady O, did you want to come back and then let me bring in our sis from the Diaspora channel and then sure. pop the duty? Sure. Yes. Um, that I, I, I. That is where I had seen when I started a presentation. I wanted to know how that would be applicable um, here in Canada. Um, if I was not able to partake in what he was stating because it is the American um, presentation. Um, and Michael um, explained more about that uh, process. So I'll have the other panels um, come around. All righty, rise up, rise up. Bringing in our sis Kai from the Diaspora Channel. Yeah, I like the fact that you highlight this same principle. We can implement it also on the continent. Because personally, you know, we have to understand that there will be brothers and sisters that will choose to stay in the West. Mm -hmm. But my first, the, the thing that matters the most right now is for us pulling our resources, our money, and build in Africa. Because when we are strong <clears throat> as Africans, the way even the whole world will treat us will be completely different than the way they treat our brothers and sisters on this planet. So the, if we can work to, you know, with this and implement it on the continent right now, for me, that I will be more you know, about that than building here because it's, it's like we, we have hearts. Let's say that's just something in us about caring about all people. But we have to realize that it is not all people that are for us. So when you've been doing something for a long period of time, like I said, some you know some brothers and sisters who choose to stay in the West, we we will do what we can do as well to to support them. But any building now, when it comes to pulling our funds and uh, resources to to build anything, may. I think more about what can we do on the continent than building, you know, in the West. Rise up, rise up, my sis. Bring it in, Prophet Maduti. Yeah. So, Tip, you know, um, I often hear um, brothers like my brother Michael, and I, I've got nothing against the brother sitting up where he is because I just saw him live, and I'm going to make sure his family and everybody there is all right. 
but I think that um, I echo more what um, Sister Kai is saying. We have to develop Africa. Um, our most eminent prophet and King His Excellency Marcus Mazaya Garvey said, when Africa is strong, we will be strong. You know, you can be strong in, um, in America, in pockets, but it don't make you as a nation strong. I think one of the things, I think it was a brother said it earlier in how they split up um, Mama Africa. You know, they split them up in these 54 different states instead of the six um, kingdoms. And it was specific and they destroyed the economical structures. So I'm setting up in the enemy's camp. And let me not say, let me say that the United Snakes of America doesn't belong to Europeans. Yeah, none at all. I think that a lot of things happens. We have to be very mindful that there were indigenous people there already. And anything that we're doing, we mustn't be as arrogant as the Europeans to just go along like these people that never existed. Uh, we are no better than they are. You understand me? And so with the, with the project that I'm involved with in Ghana, the, um, the Garvitown project, it's solely about Africans. I'm not interested in nobody else's business, but our, our business. We can do business with them. When, when we have control of our resources, then they will have to give the necessary funds or whatever credits it is we desire to dictate what prices we sell our iron ore, our coal tan, our coal burn, our uranium, our plutonium, etc. All the building blocks for the advancement and defense of a nation. I'm, uh, I'm not into this kumbaya thing. I'm 58 years old. I don't know how long I have left on the planet. So it's not about me. It is about my children, my grandchildren, them, and the rest of our African children. Anything I do know is not for me. It's not for my personal gain. It's for those yet to come. You know, there's a saying in, in, in Ghana, in the constitution, it says, the land belong to those yet to come. And so everything I, I do is for the benefit of the future because I am benefiting from the sacrifices of those that came before me. I stand on shoulders of those that came before me. Those that sacrificed their life, their family, so that I could be even on this platform here, a born white people, and stand up in a white boy face and tell him, oh, we forgot and we're not forgot. And, and do certain things strictly for African people. I don't have enough time on planet Earth to worry about nobody else. It's not me um, um, aspersing it to any other group. But if you look at every other group, nobody now worry about we. Chinese man now worry about we. The Indian man now worry about we. The Arab man now worry about we. The European now worry about we. All they do is abuse us. All of them. We invited them in. We welcome them. Yeah, we welcome the Greeks. Them abuse us. We welcome the Romans. Them abuse us. We welcome the Arabs. Them abuse us. We welcome the French, the British, all of them. And they abused us. And now their society is so technologically developed. And in all of that, all of that what they did, they still have to turn to we to initiate technology. Right there in the United Snakes of America where our beloved brother lives. Most of the, the technological advancement, if you do your research, is black people behind it. It's Africans. Yeah, not, not white Africans, black Africans, yeah, who's behind all of that with all of what they have done to us. So for me, from an economical point of view, we have to get ourselves strong as Africans. We have to sue our rubbish amongst ourselves, the traitors, the treasonous people, them. We have to create for self. And then once we have created for self and build up our defense force to defend what we have created, then we can, be, we can share with everybody else, knowing that if anybody gets out of order again, we can defend ourselves against them. And that's my position. Rise up, rise up, my that's brother it. Prophet. Thank you so, so much uh, for that. Uh, lots of thumbs up uh, in the chat as well. Lots of comments in the chat. So, you know, do look in the chat uh, periodically, family, if you want to respond to any questions, that's fine. Just want to turn uh, uh, to something that Prophet was saying about the wealth of Africa. And it's really important that <clears throat> we remember this when we 
talk about uh, money, when we talk about finances, when we talk about black economics, you know, and uh, going back to what Sister Kai was saying about, you know, our power lies in Africa. When Africa is strong, we will all be strong. Just like when you've got a strong China, Chinese people, wherever they are in the world, are regarded as strong individuals. Whilst Europe is strong, as a European anywhere in the world, you know, you are regarded as being, you know, part of a strong nation. And, you know, we've got to help to build Africa in any way that we can. And, you know, if there are good models that are in America, in the UK or anywhere else, that we might be able to look at and adapt that's going to help to build Africa, then that's absolutely fantastic. But it's also important to know that Africa is growing anyway uh, already. And, um, you know, this is something that needs to be touched on. And the wealth of Africa as well, we need to highlight for ourselves because the mainstream media doesn't tend to remind us of how wealthy act uh, Africa actually is and the battle that's actually going on out there for control of Africa. Just before COVID, we were seeing the Africa, Rus the Russian Africa Summit, the China Africa Summit, mm -hmm. the India mm -hmm. Africa Summit, the that's UK right. Africa that's right. Summit. They were all there trying to get a piece of Africa. Why were they all there? Because 9.6% of the global oil output comes from Africa. 90% of the world's platinum supply is in Africa. 90% of the world's cobalt supply. Africa, 50% of the world's gold supply is in Africa. Two thirds of the world's magnanese, Africa. 35% of the world's uranium. <laughs> Africa, 75% of the world's coltan, Africa, and that comes from uh, a documentary that was highlighting it in its re report. And if we look also at Africa's economy just before um, COVID, you know, a number, now let me get that number, I think it's about 35, 38% of the fastest growing economies in the world were actually in Africa. The GDP per capita for Sub-Saharan Africa in 2002 was $588. By 2019, it actually grown to $1,600. Uh, that was a 272% wealth increase in less than two decades. Africa is the new frontier. Africa is where it's at. Nigeria, Botswana, and Ghana growing at a, way, a rate now considered to be a middle income economy. Now, from a Pan-Africanist perspective, we want to see the whole of Africa rise. It's not enough just to build an African middle class. It's not enough just for us to have more investors in Africa that are contributing to the GDP when our people uh, on the ground are not benefiting. This Now what we're saying is we need models, you know, that's going to help the ordinary people on the ground, you know, be able to pull their resources and energies together, you know, to be able to be part of the growth and development that we all want to see Africa have. You know, we recognize the need for infrastructural development. We're the ones who are going to have to come together and actually do that. You know, so we need to be looking at, uh, you know, strategies and models that we can put in place on the ground in Africa that our people can buy into that's going to help mobilize and 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 develop africa to be to become the economy that our people can benefit from otherwise it's going to be the russians the chinese the indians and all of the others you know who are going to continue taking pieces of africa away with them and not putting Afri anything back so let's go back to our brother michael so that he can elaborate on this model and for those who want to join the model in the usa fantastic for those who want to create a similar model in africa maybe it's something we could link into michael and do who knows but let's have the conversation. Let's put it out there. We've got great models, just like our brother Prophet was saying. We've got great creators and great inventors because we are a creative and inventive people. Even during our enslavement, <clears throat> we were inventing. Mm -hmm. But let me zip it this up and bring back Michael again. We don't come again, Rada Michael. So, Hi. so okay. here's the thing that we must all. Here's the thing that we must all keep in mind, okay? Terrorists, formerly known as supremacists, are not going to just allow us to survive. They're not going to allow us 
to unite Africa, to make it greater. They're going to allow us to do that. So we must be very strategic in how we go about doing this. Now, there are three things that white terrorists respond to. One is the threat of violence. It's either violence or the threat thereof. The second is money. And the third is votes. Okay? So until we as a collective have two of those three things, we are at a strategic disadvantage. So we must be strategic in how we go about doing this. Okay? What, 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 what we know doesn't work, you cannot go heads up with this system. It, it has not worked for the last hundred plus years. Every African leader who has tried to go heads up against the white terrorists has either found themselves assassinated or overthrown through a coup. Okay? So, so we have to be strategic in the way that we do this. When we look at specifically African Americans, 40 to 50 million people, 1.2 to 1.4 trillion dollars of spending power, about 700 billion dollars of wealth. If African Americans were a nation upon themselves, they would be the third largest grossing GDP nation in the world. Okay? So, it makes sense to start organizing African Americans. Okay? It makes sense to build an app, to build an economic base in the United States. Doesn't mean that we can't simultaneously do it in the UK, that we can't simultaneously do it in the countries that are in Africa. I'm in the United States. I know America. So I choose to focus on the United States and I know how the United States works. I know that since the murder of George Floyd, there is now the desire and the willingness to come together. We haven't been like this since the 60s. Is the last time that African Americans in the United States had this level of unity, okay? Not since the Black Power Movement, which was destroyed by the FBI and J. Edgar Hoover through the COINTELPRO um, propaganda and campaign. So we already know what their playbook is because the FBI laid it out clearly in the 60s and the 70s. War on is war against black people. War on crime is a, a, a war against black people. Abortions is war against black people, right? We have to be strategic in the way that we move things. So what I believe and what the group that I um, am, am a part of believe is that through the use of investment clubs, we'll call for opportunity funds and creating these private gated, black owned and black controlled communities, what we do is we start to build that economic base because the because so, the economic base is based on real estate, right? You have own land. Once you own land, then you have the means of production and if you um, um, do it in um, gated communities. Now you start to recycle that black dollar which currently doesn't recycle at all, okay? Now you start to concentrate, how is that $1.4 trillion spent every year by Blacks in the United States? Now you start to create generational wealth that's based on real estate. In the United States, we have a thing called Qualified Opportunity Funds. We can thank President Trump when he passed his 2017 Jobs and Tax, Tax Act, he also passed the Investing in Opportunity Act, which created opportunity zones, which created opportunity funds. 
Real briefly, here's the benefit of an opportunity fund. It allows anyone in the United States to roll over capital gains into an opportunity fund that invests in opportunity zones. Opportunity zones are basically poor areas in the United States where a lot of blacks live but you can only use capital gains to invest in opportunity funds. When you do that, there are three huge tax benefits. One, you don't pay any tax on that capital gains until 2026. When you don't pay tax on something, your money continues to work longer for you. The second is come 2026, if it's been invested in the opportunity fund for at least five years, now you get a 10% reduction in the tax that's owed. The third is if you keep it invested for 10 years, the appreciation of that investment is now 100% tax-free when you sell it. So I use the example. If, if you own Apple shares right now and you've made $100,000 and you sell it, and you roll it over in the next 180 days into a qualified opportunity fund, and you invest it for 10 years. And let's just say it goes from 100,000 to $300,000. So that's $200,000 gain that you won't have to pay any tax on. You don't pay income tax, you don't pay capital gains tax, you don't pay the what they call the ATM tax, okay? It is by far, the greatest legal means by which black people can redevelop their our black areas with real estate while simultaneously creating generational wealth. So that's the tool that we've chosen, chosen to focus on here in the U.S. in order to build that economic base, which will ultimately allow us to be able to transfer that wealth and to assist the entire diaspora. Um, that sounds like a beautiful um, idea, my brother. Um, however, um, I, I'm not into that investing in stuff in, in, in them lands for that length of time. Um, if you're doing that, it would be good that you're tied up in trust for your children. You know what I'm saying? I don't know what age you are, but 10 years from now, I'm, I'm 68, touching 70. You know what I'm So it's not going to be for me. You know what I'm saying to you? And so um, I still have loved, is of the notion that we should concentrate on developing things that our children will inherit. And so developing the minds of our children to take over those things and developing the mind that um, here is not your own. It was never your own. Your own, and this is, you see, I can speak from the position of a kidnapped ch child. My descendants was kidnapped from Mama Africa and taken to the Caribbean. And then my parents come from the Caribbean and came here. So I don't, I don't tell my children them about developing nothing in Britain. Me tell them anything you get, yes, or you can take it and go, go back to Africa with it. But that's how you forgot, and that's how you develop, develop. And so for me, that's a very um, that structure you got is very good. I was wondering how could you replicate that in Mama Africa? Have you got um, a division in your company or in your organization that's looking to develop in Africa simultaneously, or is this structure just um, within the United States of America? So the, the one thing that we learn about being strategic is that you have to do multiple things simultaneously, right? So Malcolm X's um, famous saying is by any means necessary. And our saying is by all means necessary. And so um, we can walk and chew gum at the same time, right? Um, but I can tell you this. I can't help build up Africa if I can't survive where I'm at, right? 
If I can't mm -hmm. feed myself, close my, clothe myself, house myself, educate myself, feed and protect myself, how can I help anybody else if I can't survive? So each of our survival must be the very first thing of our priorities. We have to survive in order to be able to transfer resources to Africa. Otherwise, they will continue to do what they've been doing for hundreds of years, which is just kicking us off as we try to rise up and do things in Africa. All they've done is either assassinate or develop coups. We have to develop a long-term strategy. We have to be strategic about it. Because the thing that whites are, they are very strategic. They are very strategic. They've got their systems in place. Their systems and institutions outlive them to continue on the horrible works that they put in place. So you are right. We have to create generational wealth. We have to re-educate ourselves. One thing that we know, we can look at other cultures. We can look at the Japanese after World War II. We can look at the Chinese since the 1980s. It takes one generation, one generation to totally change people, okay? The Japanese, after they were had two atomic bombs dropped on them, within um, 20 to 30 years, in the 80s, they tried to buy America. They came and tried to buy up all the commercial property in America, I believe, as a means of getting back at America for dropping them bombs on them. Okay. When you look at the Chinese, the Chinese in the 80s was an agricultural based economy. Look at them now. Literally within one generation. So what we know with Africa is that within one generation, Africa can become the leading superpower in the world. But we ain't the only ones that know that, right? White terrorists know that. China knows that. And, and not just going to allow that to happen. They never have, never will. So we have to be strategic in the way that we do it. And again, I believe there's those three things, violence or the threat thereof, money, and votes. We need two out of three in order to become that quote unquote superpower. When you look at China and you have to ask yourself, how did white terrorists allow China to become a superpower in 25 years? Well, they didn't allow China. China has been a superpower for thousands of years, right? It's one of the oldest civilizations on the planet. It has, it has always had a superpower um, position in the world, except for 200 years, the 1800s and the 1900s. That's it. So what the Chinese know is that when they come together as a collective and move as one, they are unstoppable. And they have proven that. Okay? Africans can be the same way as long as we come and start to move as one. Now, we're spread out throughout the diaspora. Some of us have been disconnected from our cultural and our heritage and everything like that. The greatest tool that we have is what we're on right now, social media, okay? The internet is the best thing that ever happened to black folks in the last couple hundred years because they can no longer, white chairs can no longer control the dissemination of information the way that they had been doing up until that time. Their best effort to can control I just, can I just jump in there, my brother? Fake news. Sure, go ahead. Uh, um, and permission from my sisters, to, because uh, I don't know if any of the sisters want to say anything. Okay, we, uh, uh, I'll bring them in after you, Prophet, if that's okay. Go, go ahead. Yeah. Um, right, uh, 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 a couple of things. Africa was always a superpower, right up until the 14th century. In fact, right up until the, the 15th century. Africa was always a superpower. We had empires running things. 
The Chinese were never um, enslaved. They were invaded, but they were never um, kidnapped from their homeland and enslaved. They moved to places as indentured servants, but never enslaved. No group on this planet endured what we endured apart from the Native American people in the soil where you are now. So um, we cannot equate the Chinese with we. And our civilizations and our empires are older than the Chinese. Yeah, we were trading with the Chinese long before the Europeans came out of the cave. So um, that's the first point. And I agree with you that when we galvanize our resources together, we can turn things around. But there's no resources nobody bring into Africa more than this and manpower. The, the, the knowledge that they have stolen and refined um, within their, their boundaries. They don't talk about resources because all with them teeth out of Africa, we don't need it because we have more, much more there. We just need our people with the, um, the skills of being an architect, an engineer, a, um, um, a nanoscientist, satellite worker, all them kind of technological science to come home to Africa and help Africans develop the resources that is there. And then we can sell it to them, not give them the resources and then buy back the products. You understand me? So um, this is about bringing resources to Africa. No, nobody no need to bring no resource. The only resource they need to bring is people with technological know-how because all the resources are there. And a third thing, Africa is developing. We have car manufacturers. We have our own scientists. But as you said before, my beloved brother, we don't control the external media. We just have social media. So they're not going to promote how Africa is developing and them things there. There's people in the Americas where you live and different parts of the diaspora think that people in Africa are still living in huts. And there's no road and there's no um, industry, no e-commerce and them thing there. Africa are going with things. It's just that we don't know about it. You understand what I say? And so I'm fully aware of all that technological um, things that happen within the West. And I get it. You know, people live, you know, we live here and we live a certain way. And we want to live that way when we live it, when, when we leave here. You understand me? But we have to take that first jump. When my parents came here, they never have nothing. My parents come out of England, you know, they never have nothing. One womb, they are living now. My father, the first job him do, he was serving tea before he could, he could execute him trade. You understand what I say? So if our parents can take that jump to jump out into the unknown, why can't we take that jump to jump into the known? Because the known is Mama Africa. And everything that I do, what I talk to my children in, in the Saturday school where we africate the children them about who they are and get them to say, you need to africate yourself and acquire certain knowledge and certain skills. And those skills, you know, eventually you should use it for the development of your people and your continent. That's what I think we should be doing. I agree with you about strategy. I have no issues with about strategy. But Africa has to be at the core of anything we are doing. Even if we're looking after ourselves, and yes, we, have to, we, we know all them talk that we have to close ourselves. We, we all them something there all the while. And I don't know that. Anyway, you're there, you have to live. If you're there, Africa, you have to close yourself first. You have to feed your family. We don't know that. But what do we do next? What's the prime objective? That's the question. What is the prime objective. And from my position and my organization, our prime objective is the development and advancement and the liberation of the cultural, spiritual, economical practices of our mother land. Okay. Rise up, rise up, Prophet. Thank you for your intervention there. Let me, um, your contribution there rather, let me bring in uh, Sister Kai who we haven't heard from for a little while. Sister Kai, okay. what thoughts, opinions, comments uh, on what's been discussed so far? I think what uh, Brother Michael said 
the strategy part is very, very important. And what I can add, what a brother, uh, the prophet is saying, someone already said it in the chat, we have lots of projects in Africa, but without money, I agree that we have resources there. But still, before we move here and start fixing certain things, we still need money, though we have lots of resources there. So we can't neglect that uh, aspect. So marrying both of the brother's ideas, I think that's what we need to start you know, uh, embracing. So personally, that's what I will say. Great, the resources are there, but we need the funds as well to implement things that we want to do uh, on the motherland. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much for your contribution there, Sister Kai. And, uh, you know, this is where we are now with the conversation about the power of money to transform resources into produces that can be manufactured, that can be marketed, and that can be sold. The power of money. I mean, some people will look at money and they'll see it as maybe just bits of paper. And some people will look at money and they will see it as currency, as energy, you know? This is what, you know, people work for. Uh, money seems to stimulate or seems to bring out an energy to want to make things happen. So we could have a great idea. There could be a mine there that needs digging, yeah? But unless there's money, people, the way we've been conditioned, we're not going to get up out of bed to go and dig and do the mining unless the money's going to be there to pay us at the end of the month. But what about if we had the mindset where we had the energy to dig because we're going to be mining for our future generations. We're going to be mining, you know, to bring up the resources that, that can then be turned into products for our future generations. What about thinking we need to make a sacrifice in order to be the change that we want to see? And as our brother Michael was saying earlier as well, within one generation, Africa can change. Africa can become a leading technological country. Now, we're already leading uh, on many fronts, but we're just not going to get the recognition and the accolade for it because, you know, as has been said, we don't control the media. But as was pointed out, you know, Africa has its own car manufacturing companies. It does have its factories. It's doing, if you look at some of the great cities across Africa that's going up, you would think that you were in cities in the West that we see all the time uh, in their mainstream media, but that we don't tend to see in Africa. Africa is, has got technology, it's advancing, it's infrastructure, is, is growing year on year. There's a huge amount of development happening in, in Africa. So in terms of currency, you know, and the energy that we get from money, what about if we started looking at how we could use that energy to contribute towards the growth and the development of the next generation? So that's one thing. Secondly, uh, in terms of money, what about if we look at, you know, creating our own economic network so that wherever we are in the world, we are trading with each other. So we're trading with each other, not just on a local level or on a national level, but on an international and global level, which is what Europeans do after all because you know they have created a global network for themselves. So for example, when I was in um, Zimbabwe, I noticed that the Europeans, they, they stuck together as a clique, they all had their businesses. If a new European visited the country, they would bring them in as part of the club, they would do business with each other's businesses, and they would export to their fellow brothers and sisters abroad. So they're doing business with their own people. What we tend to do is not realize the race dynamics and seek to do business with other people in business, whether they are of our hue or not. Whereas what they tend to do is stick with their own. They seek out their businesses to do business with wherever they are in the world. So, you know, you can have businesses, European and businesses in France, doing business with European businesses in Holland, in Belgium, in America. They are basically doing business with each other around the world. They created their business network. We need to also create our own business matrix 
where we are circulating and bouncing that pound within our community, not just locally, but globally. And this is where the, the trillion dollar power spend that you're talking about the Americans having being spent not just in America, but also in Africa, also in the Caribbean, and wherever we are in the world, and building all of our own economies. Uh, Prophet, I heard you wanted to jump in there, then we're gonna yeah. bring in Lady Go, who we haven't heard from yeah. for a while. Yes, yeah. Sister Shanice, that's a very poignant thing that you say, you know, because anywhere you find the Europeans on the continent, they only, they only click with themselves, and they, they have their own little private armies, within Africa, protecting themselves. And the key factor to what Brother Michael was saying, um, he said it three times, they will not allow you and being strategic. One of the strategies that we must look at is defense. We must look at defense. We must run away from that. We must look to defend anything that we're creating. Because just like Black Wall Street, them drop a bomb on it. See? When the Black Panther Party was creating something for black people, that they, they infiltrate them, them, um, them turn them into criminals and destroy the organization. The same with the Universal Negro Improvement Association, Marcus Garvey and ACL, them destroy it. You understand what I say? So um, we must look at defense to defend our e-commerce. As we could create all this economics, we can create all this money and these things. And once them, once them discover um, where we have, yeah? Them just come teeth and box up and take it when we can't defend it. Because that is the nature of who we're dealing with. We're not dealing with people who like to share. They like to share when they must share out the something. Because they always hold back most of it. You understand me? So defense is a key thing that we have to look at when we're dealing with economics. Okay. Rise up, rise up, profit, defense, absolutely critical. Agree with you on that, especially when we remember Wall Street as you did uh, then. And uh, as you said earlier, this is where, you know, the technological know-how is critical because, you know, our, I, I believe that our, uh, our defense lies in our technological abilities and it's in the mind and it's just waiting for, for the, its creator to bring it forth. But we have to make sure that when the creator of that, that super technological defense system, which, you know, is almost like a, a force field around Africa, you know, uh, you know, when they come up with the idea that they don't just take it to you know those who don't look like us don't like us and uh, and sell it to them which will then be used against us but anyway let me allow lady o to come in because we haven't heard from you for a while my sis uh what are your views thoughts and comments on the conversation that we're having uh, we've been having so far um my my this is how i see the strategy and it's what everybody's saying on the panel, and I was also looking at what the chat is saying. The reality is, um, as we all are aware of, Africa has leadership. And Africa leadership is a part of the problem. And the reason why they're part of the problem is because the people are kept at a standard of living where they see and they continually see Europeans as the hope, the answer, the solution. And not just Europeans, because Asians aren't Europeans, but they're just a very light shade that's very close to European. What we, what's very important for us to understand is to build Africa, we have to build ourselves. The strategy that I see that makes sense, invest in, if you are in America, I'm in Canada, so I can't partake in Michael's strategy. 
But any of my contacts that I know are there, I send them to Michael's site. And this is the strategy. The Chinese are taking over the motherland. As much as we want to educate our cells they're taking over because they're not making deals with the neighborhood they're making deals with the leadership mm -hmm. so let's just be real here they're not making deals with those that are on the ground they're making deals with the leadership so this is how i see it this is just how i look at it and this is what i know to be true here in canada i don't know where it is else anywhere else Wherever the Chinese two or three are gathered, you know, when we say where two or three are gathered, there it is. Wherever they gather, their money go back to the homeland. It is part of like a contract that once they leave the homeland and they migrate to anywhere, they build up, they create a community wherever they are. That money stays there, but a portion of that money goes back to the mainland. The mainland stays and the mainland does a thing, but wherever you go outside of China, all the Chinese that are in all the different countries in Africa, none of their money bounces into the community right there. It goes right back to China. All of the infrastructure, all the stuff that's happened in the motherland, based on all of the documentaries that I'm seeing, and also heard of the speech from the UN ambassador, she put everybody on blast, and that went viral last year, about the loans and the debts that the African countries are in through France, to Germany, through everybody else. Because the leadership is the one making the plans, people. How can we take back the power, people? Yes, you're saying to send engineers back. Yes, you're saying to... But the leadership is the one that's going to be making all the blue tape, red tape, purple tape, black tape, yellow plate, and all the tapes that's there. So I, this is how I see it. They're not going to allow us to just bring all of our intellectual property and build up and they just sit back with their hands folded. They're not going to. So this is how I see the strategy. Michael's framework is great if we can duplicate it in Africa. I would love for it to be duplicated in Canada. Why? Because I'm here. And I know if we can get a community here, just the fact, just the mere fact that if we in the UK, in America, in Canada, if we have our own self-sufficient community, trust and believe. They don't want that because they know it's what? Duplicatable. That's number one. So what Michael is doing, I want him to succeed where he's at. Because once he, once, not he, not once if, once it is going to, when it is successful, Michael, so I'm speaking into existence you would create a blueprint. The individuals who are invested in your plan, they're going to see it. And what I would love for them to do, and if you share this video with your people, this is what I think their strategy should be. Part of the proceeds of your fund or part of the proceeds, find a way for it to go back to Africa. Let's send some of that monies Back to Africa. What I love about what Michael is saying, and I look at a bigger picture. My prophet, I, he's in his 50s, I'm in my 40s. So everything we do, yes, is generational. You could will all that to your children, yes. But listen to what he's saying. The tax shelter that you are going to acquire if you're in America, run to Michael's site. Listen to the big picture here, people. The tax shelter you're going to get once you stay there is the same tax shelter that all of the Europeans have been sheltered under. And it's that same money that they use with that shelter that they go and they terrorize us. They terrorize us in Africa and where we are here. Every time there's a leadership that rises up, they terrorize them with the money. Guess whose money they're using to assassinate your leaders who want to emancipate you? 
the same money they're using under these shelters in America, in the UK. So I understand where we want to build up America and we want to build up Africa. But we have to understand their strategy. Every time one of your African leaders rise up to emancipate their people, they get assassinated, not with African dollars. They're using foreign dollars that we help make possible with dash tax shelters. So this is what I'm passionate about because I need us just to wake up and see the real picture here, people. If you are in America, go and look at Michael's plan when he shares his information. Get a strategy in place so we can find reason that whatever prophet has in Ghana, whatever sister Shanice has in um, Gambia, whatever my queen has here in the diaspora where she's at, find out those boots on the ground, those community initiatives. They need what? Money. We can pray all we want to. We can meditate all we want to. We can send all the vibrations, but they need money. You know why the Munzukus and everybody is successful when they get there? Because they drop ship all of the aid from the sky. They drop ship aid to our people when it's our people that it's sending, that they're sending out from Africa, and then they just dwindle a little bit back to us. So this is what I see the strategy to be. If you can partner with Michael where you are in America, and you can take advantage of his tax shelter where when it comes out, you pay zero. Listen to the fine print. The details is in the fine print. The devil is in the details, and the details is in the fine print. When that money comes out apart from you building up your community and the eyes seeing right that's up that we are building our community that money now find africa so when our leaders when the people in africa don't have to feel the pressures the 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 all of the initiatives that all of our brothers and sisters in the diaspora and in the motherland is implemented, they need money. And it's better when the money comes from us. And it's not a loan. A loan doesn't have legs and hands attached to it. If we can send our own people the initiatives and it's from us and there's no strings attached, the strings attached is that you build, you rise up and you teach. We are here. We want to help you, but we also have to help ourselves first because when my son goes out of this door in Canada, when he walks out of this door, right, yes, sir, in Canada, I want him to be in a community where nobody feel like they could touch him because they know all hell is going to break loose because we have money power. So we have to. It is, imp it is imperative that we build up where we are. And when we building up where we are, we keep the money within. We create an environment where our kids could walk out of that door and our community is self-sufficient. We have our fire, our medical, mm -hmm. our law, our, our schools, it's our community. And Michael will go more into that if we if, with the time that he has. How he's modeling that. It's going to be our community and my prophet. We could have your erudition taught in our schools in America, in Canada. They can get Af Aphrodite. They can get the Afrocentric, all of the information that you have in the UKK. They can, they can be a part of our school system. Mm -hmm. And as we rise them up, we're also teaching them about the financial security, but also the financial responsibility that they send the money back to Africa. That's what the Chinese do. The Hindu stands that's, in, that's, in, that's here also in Canada. They send the money right back. Yeah, rise up, rise up. Sister lady, oh, on fire. For real, my sis. 
You know, we have to be the change that we want to see. And as was said earlier in the talk, you know, Africa can change within one generation. We can rise up Africa within one generation if we have that right mindset. And if we have a powerful Africa, then wherever in the world we are, we are powerful. Just imagine, you know, if a, if a child in Canada or a child in America is assaulted by the police and the African government stands up and says, that's my Africa child you know we want your embassy to come to our offices right now and account for what's happened we want to know what investigations are happening what actions are going to be taken we want this matter looked into a powerful Africa is will be able to defend us as a people and defend our children wherever we are in the world but a weak Africa will not be able to come to our rescue or our defense at all you mentioned Lady O when you was talking about aid as well and I've got some information here let me quickly bring that to you and then we're going to go back to the panel it says here that in 2012 the last year of recorded data developing countries received a total of 1.3 trillion including all aid that's investment income from abroad they received a total of 1.3 trillion this is so-called developing countries but that same year 3.3 trillion actually flowed out from those same countries to the developed, so-called developed worlds. In other words, developing countries sent 2 trillion more to the rest of the world than what they received from the so-called developed world. And if we look at all the years since 1980, these net outflows actually add up, it says, to an eye-popping total of 16.3 trillion that's how much money is being drained out and leaked out of sub-sahara africa uh, and has been for the last decade and continues to because we need to as well as you know do what we need to do wherever we are in the world also make sure that we have our sights and our interests in what's going on in Africa, because a powerful Africa economically, a powerful Africa politically, a powerful mm. Africa uh, spiritually means that Africa can contribute towards our development wherever we are in the world. When African businesses go to Africa, yeah, and they're pitching to African governments to, do, mm -hmm. to help build their infrastructure, where do we think they're getting that money from? They're getting it from their Chinese banks. When the mm. Indians comes to Africa, Africa to do business, they're being backed and supported by the by the Indian banks because the Indians are investing in their banks, which means that they have money to then reinvest in 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 their 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 nation's businesses. And so it's really important, whatever strategies that we develop, that we also consider how it can be applied on the motherland to contribute towards the growth and development of mm. the continent. And if we all had that mindset, if we all had that mindset, it would influence our actions, our thinking would influence our actions and, and our strategies and our plans, and we could see the change happening globally almost overnight. But, you know, we're getting there. I, I rolled out some statistics earlier as proof and evidence that no matter how it, difficult and challenging, challenging it may appear, yeah, when you look at the, at the growth and development compared to other countries in the world, Africa is out there leading the world in terms of growth and development, hence COVID to try and set us back. Uh, I won't go into the figures right now because I want to go around the panel, but I can actually show you how they've actually moved some of those progressive African countries from a position of, um, you know, where they were reducing their debt to now where they've indebted them again, you know, with these huge COVID loans. But I'm, I'm not going to digress. But, you know, because we're going to be talking, we're going to continue to, to talk about how we can use money and our economic strategies and plans to help develop us as a people wherever we are in the world. Let's go to Brother Michael, then back to Profit, uh, then uh, Lady Kai and Lady O to finish off our discussion this evening. Brother Michael, a lot's been said, a lot's been discussed. Let's bring you back here so we can hear your views, thoughts and opinions, please. <laughs> Sure. So I think the one thing, the, the theme 
that every single person in this panel is seeing, um, and also being said comments is that we must become chess masters at this game. We have to become chess masters, which means we must move strategically. We must think six or seven steps ahead. We have mm. to understand um, what will be the movements um, against those who come against us, right? So mm. I talked about how Malcolm X said there are three philosophies to black nationalism, political, economic, and social. I said that there are three things that white terrorists respond to, violence or the threat thereof, money and votes. Now, we need to have a, a base of at least two of those. So, and economics has to be a central one, right? Because it's with the economic base that you're able to fund the political um, base. It's with the economic base that you're able to fund the social and the educational base that's necessary. It's with the economics that you're able to defend yourself, right? It's the threat. It's, again, violence or the threat thereof. The reason why the United States will never, ever attack China and they do all this um, 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 radar, uh, all this um, rattling of their sabers is because China has nuclear weapons, mutually assured destruction, right? And, and so, um, but China also made sure that it's tied at the hip economically with the U.S. by buying the U.S. treasuries. So there are strategies that we can learn from other cultures in the way that they deal with these white terrorists. But we have to build an economic base. And so the strategy and the plan that we've come up with in the United States, it all starts with investment clubs. And this is what I say. Investment clubs is the first piece of a thousand piece puzzle because ultimately we must own and control all pieces of the supply chain. Right. We talk about real estate being the economic base, right? But there's also, you have to control your um, communication system, right? We don't control no communication system. I don't see no Black-owned cable company. I don't see no Black-owned um, uh, um, um, cellular company, okay? We create a bunch of content, but whose platform is it on, right? We have to control all of it. Because if we don't own all of it, it can be taken away from us at any time. Okay? So let me tell you real quick what we're doing here in the United States. The city of Detroit is our template. And the reason why it's the, our template is the blackest city in the United States It is 90% black. It is one of the hardest economically hit cities in the United States. Had the largest public bankruptcy in 2013, but it has come back with a vengeance with white money flowing into Detroit to rebuild the downtown areas and the waterfronts, what they consider the most valuable areas. They have then gentrified areas around downtown where they want white people to live close to where they work, but they've left the black areas decimated. Go on to Google Maps, turn on the satellite view, look at certain areas of Detroit. It will look like a war zone. Okay. No, is that if we roll out our plan and it's successful in Detroit, that it can be then replicated in other areas. And we have a very aggressive um, time span for doing that. 2021 is the year to roll it out into. Detroit to refine our system, um, to um, roll the system out, to document how the system works, to train on the system. 2022, we're going to replicate that system in 20 additional U.S. black cities throughout the United States. And then in 2023, we're going to roll out another 20. So that within a three-year period, 
we're going to try to have 41 black cities in the United States that are implementing this system and building these economic centers, okay? Now, the same thing can be done in the UK. The same thing can be done in Canada. All you have to do is take our system and tweak it, adjust it to fit your specific situations. The same things can also be done in Africa, right? We have to be strategic about it. And again, just like pieces of a puzzle, they're, they're all linked. And so um, what, I, what I would like to end on my part saying is we must become chess masters at this game. We must prepare and respond accordingly. We must re-educate the black community. We must support and provide for the black community. And for me and those that are here in the US, we must survive America by all means necessary. Rise up, rise up, my brother, family. Um, our brother Michael's website address is on the screen now. Check it out. There's a lot of information there uh, about the um, black business strategy that he's been uh, touching on for us today. Thank you so, so much, uh, brother Michael. Prophet Kwaku. Yeah. Um, I want to go back to something um, Sister Lady O said. And everybody is saying, and somebody wrote it in the in in the chat. Money is going to be obsolete soon. They're going into Bitcoin and Lumi and all these different kind of um fun. They they they're changing, they're changing the dynamics. They're changing the game. So the, yes, yes, Michael, we have to be very good chess players. Um, still thinking that we must invest in Africa. For one thing that Sister Shanice said, this, um, the Europeans send a trillion of, of aid, they take two trillion out. So how can you take two trillion out of somewhere where you ain't got no money? Yeah? Nice. In this country here, they've got a thing they call furlough, where they might pay people for stealing because, you know, this COVID thing. A 280 billion it costs them already, you know. Mm. And nobody now got to work. So where do I get them the money from? Africa, they might get the money from. Africa. The money they are Africa. Yeah? All the resources that we need is in Africa. Mm -hmm. And anything that we're doing, Africa must be at the center of it. So yes, Michael, I will look at your website and I will have a look at your thing. But my whole thing is about redeveloping Africa. And the main thing is this. All these strategies that you're talking about, brother. You see, if you can't military, mil militarily protect it, they will take it from you. And where you going to do? If you can't defend it physically, where you going to do? Because that's how you... These guys are terrorists. That's what they do. they do. History is best qualified to reward our research. Malcolm X, tell us that. Study your enemy and you know if to deal with him in the future. If we don't build up a defense force to defend our things, everything we, we, else we're doing is going to fall apart. And lastly, we don't have leaders in, uh, in, in Africa. We have treasoners in Africa who's doing business. There's only one or two of them. Them is not leaders. They are colon they're, they're near colonial masters. And we must africate our children them about these terms, about the behavior and the, uh, and the actions of these type of neo colonialists who will sell out them people them. So we, you know there's very few leaders in Africa right now. They're treasonous people that occupy those, those, those places. Some of them is, is standing up now. Um, um, Gagame in Rwanda, a my man down in a Tanzania, yeah, and even even the um, um the Ghanaian um, um prime minister, 
I start leak out upon them with certain things. But we mu we must have a Central African defense force. And and I'm not, I'm not just talking about dropping bombs. I'm talking about cyber defense. Yeah? I'm talking about economical defense, cultural defense, spiritual defense, and physical defense. Hotep. Oh, Teb, rise up, rise up, Prophet. Thank you so much uh, for that wonderful uh, contribution. Let's go over to uh, Lady Kai on the Diaspora channel. Thanks so much. Like, uh, there is so much I personally embrace by hearing everything, you know, everyone on the panel said. And what I can say, you know, towards the end is we... African people, some people say black people, we are powerful and we can do anything. It's all about us being organized. So the right strategy have to be on the table. We have to buy from our brothers and sisters. And we also have to learn to start trusting one another. That's so great. it's good, it's beautiful to meet here online and you know discuss about lots of different things that have been affecting us for so long excuse me well if you really the type that want to be part of the solution the emails is already in the chat because there are lots of things we have in store we are working <clears throat> on right now and personally i don't like putting things out and i'm sure the panel will agree with this so make sure you, you know, you contact, uh, you send us an email and then our monthly meeting, you will be able to join that. I personally promote black businesses only on my channel. That's what I do. That's why I dedicate my time and energy to keep doing. Yes, some people will find it boring promoting businesses. I said, that's your own. But I know it matters. Our businesses matter. So wherever you are, we are talking about, well, power. Where the power comes from? We can say so many things, but if we don't have the money, we, we can have great ideas, great, great plans, but we need the money to start moving things around. So if you are the type that, uh, you know, you don't support our businesses, please kindly, humbly know that you are also part of the problem. Start supporting our businesses wherever you are. And then the next step is for us to meet and you letting us know what you are doing, what you can, what you can actually put on the table. Because, you know, all of us, we want the change. And I think and I know that we are ready for it. So now let's be organized and keep it moving because we can actually do this. So people in the chat, beautiful family in the chat, they are asking for your contact. So please, everyone on the panel, please pull your contacts in and you can know more. I put also my Instagram uh, link in the chat. You can DM me, you can email me, and I'm going to do the same for our brothers and sisters. You know, also that are like-minded people that are more about change. Because I said it already last time, where is the white savior complex comes from? It's because they don't see people like us. That's how it used to be on the continent, helping, moving things around. So they think the person has to look certain way to be someone that can help them, that can change things around. No, we are powerful. We are strong. We are smart people. And we definitely can do this. But one thing I'm, I'm going to beg our brothers and sisters here, let's be organized. And thanks so much for having me on tonight, Sister Shanice. And uh, so good, you know, meeting Brother Michael. I would love to know more about what he's doing. Brother Kweku, he's right here, not, not far from where I live. So I'll just cross the road and we take 
from there and say, and lady, oh, I'll definitely, definitely email you, but we have lots of work to do. And let's start and start now. If you don't remember anything from this stream at all, no money is power. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, my sister. -in. And uh, just want to add to what you're saying. I mean, the time has whizzed by already. Uh, all just a minute away from the top of the hour. I want to thank each and every one of my panel members uh, for your contribution today. Their uh, contact details is in the chat. Do go to the websites and do get in touch for more information. And uh, just to remind us, you know, that we are uh, what money is. You know, we are the energy, you know, and we are the ones that have the currency and we are the ones that can determine what we do with that money. And therefore, we have the power to be the change that we want to see. We are the creators. We are the ones who are able to think creatively and then to manifest that creativity into existence. If we look back into history and we see the wonderful, monumental, huge, colossal cities, empires, kingdoms and buildings that our ancestors did. It just gives you a glimpse into our potential as a people. And so we need to start thinking outside of the box, acting outside of the box and reclaiming our greatness as a people and begin to look inside for the answers that we're looking for uh, to manifest. Because inside of us, are the answers to all of the problems. And as Michael said very early on, we could, you know, Africa could be a leading technological country with a continent rather within one generation, which means that we, the now generation, have the power to be the change that we want to see. So we want to leave you on that note where hopefully you feel empowered to begin to manifest you know, that creativity with inside, within you and wherever you are in the world and in whatever you are doing, remember, if Africa is powerful, we are all powerful. If Africa is strong, we are strong. You take holidays, holiday in Africa. You're looking to buy a product, look to see if Africa has that product that you can buy from Africa rather than going to Alibaba and supporting China. If you're looking to find a business partner, you know, ADDI, doing huge amounts of work on the continent to identify credible business partners that we can partner with. If you are interested in the model that our brother Michael was outlining today, go to his website, find out more and contact him to see how you can maybe set up a similar model or franchise within the country or within the area where you are so that you could be helping to contribute towards the growth and development of our community. Let's be conscious about where we're spending our money who we're spending our money with and how we're spending their money and how we are investing it. Let's find each other, support each other. Someone was asking whether Prophet's got land in Africa or house in Africa. He's got land in Africa. He's got about 500 acres of land in Africa. It's awaiting its developers. It is awaiting the real estate developers to come in with a plan to develop it. Maybe we'll have to do a show just on that. So on that note, I want to rise up the entire family, all of our viewers and family. Please, please be black with us. Same time, next strong, and also have a blacktastic strong. More love, more power, more voodoo. Hey, and I think we've got Dynasty Mir joining us next strong as well. So tune in nice and early. He's a man that's doing arounds across Africa. Voodoo! More power, more strength, more love. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Prophet. Thank you, Sister Kai and Lady O. Sister Shanice out of here for Hotel. now. Rising up the panel. Hotel. Peace and love.